The topic is discipleship in the academy, uh, discipleship in theological education, and what I'd like for you to uh, do is to go with me into a workshop situation. Because I'm really, after about 40 years in formal theological education, mostly on the graduate level in Germany and the United States mostly, but also in other institutions, um, uh, mostly around Europe and the United States, uh, I have been wrestling with issues about theological education. And so what I'm uh, hoping to present to you is a, a process, a wrestling with issues. I am not a practitioner, so you're not going to get a lot of practical indications of how to do good theological education. What I'm trying to do is grasp on the way Jesus um, discipled, mentored, taught Peter. And that goes back to a study that I published with Paternoster Press just this last December. Uh, I do have a copy here that you can look at. Uh, uh, I'll pass that through. Uh, so I will use some of the material that I have uh, put together here. Um, you could call it holistic training, holistic education, but uh, actually you will see that I'm just working on a, a big mine and I have a particular area that I'm looking at um, uh, to help you, to challenge you, uh, and also to get feedback from you. Um, so I'm not giving you a finished product and it's very much uh, a reflection on what, what is the impact of Christ on Peter and how can we as theological ed educators or educators more broadly speaking um, be involved in such a transformative uh, world. So I'm not going to give you a lot of practical work. You have to um, listen to other people for that. So uh, it is in some ways a interdisciplinary study between um, uh, Christian origins and character formation. And normally you don't do those two things together. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, to give you a little bit of a setting for Peter, uh, his education, but what I'm going to try to focus on is the question of what transformed the man? <clears throat> so that's what I'm going to work on. And then I think you are very good translators, very good um, uh, uh, able to, to think that through in educational terms. Um, how then can we uh, be um, involved in theological education that has a similar kind of impact as Christ did on Peter. So discipleship in the academy going back to the uh, relational tutelage of Peter and to look at the way Jesus uh, shaped Peter and I would say as a foundational uh, witness to the uh, reliability, the truth, and the compelling nature of the gospel, but also as exhibit A of the formation. So Peter, I'm arguing in this book, is both a guarantor for the apostolic foundation of the Christian uh, witness, but he is also a living letter that reflects the chiseling and the work in terms of loyalties, devotions, um, affections, um, moral conviction uh, in uh, Peter, uh, and it is quite a wide spectrum from where he came from to where he ends up in. So uh, let me um, go into that. Uh, obviously the first point I've skipped, so let me just go back to that briefly. Uh, my personal exp uh, experience in education, I, was, um, I went to gymnasium in Stuttgart, Germany. So I got a good bit of the German uh, form of education. Uh, I did a, a additional Latin course in 12th grade alongside the regular curriculum um, uh, uh, just to get into the classic languages. And then I did the Hebraicum and Grecum in a college that was associated with Tübingen. 
um, and then started to study theolo theological subjects in Tübingen uh, under people like Gerhard Meyer, Peter Stuhlmacher, I heard Hans Küng and others there, then moved to the United States to a brethren school that was very unaware of critical issues. I had been born to living faith in Christ in the midst of uh, historical critical studies in Germany and then came to a place where everything was just very simple and very uncontested. But I needed a constructive face in my life rather than a time only to see what is the foundation of the Christian faith and how to defend it. And then I returned to Scotland, uh, Aberdeen University, uh, where I studied with uh, uh, Robin Barber and uh, Howard Marshall and other people there. Uh, had a wonderful uh, time there. Uh, went on to teach at the German Theological Seminary that is now the Freie Theologische Hochschule in uh, Gießen and then moved to Covenant Theological Seminary in 1994, and I've been stuck there since, but uh, have come to Europe a lot. So, but educationally, I have been exposed to the German, British, um, or Scottish, if you want to say that, and uh, American form of higher education. Um, very much a talking head on a stick. Uh, the more you know, the better. The better the arguments, the better. And if you understand something, if you grasp something, uh, hopefully very comprehensively, you've got it. And I had to learn the hard way that the subject of uh, biblical studies actually goes far beyond that. It does not uh, bracket uh, intellectual formation. It does not bracket knowledge. It does not bracket a uh, good grasp of all kinds of disciplines. But then it moves forward to the formation of the whole person, the affections of that person, the true values of that person, the true uh, desires of that person, the abilities of relating well and uh, to have what they now call emotional intelligence in relationships, to have the ability to look at yourself from a distance and to name and identify where your problems are, especially as a leader. Can I listen to other people or not, etc. You can see this field here. My prejudice to the United States was that I'm going into a world of pragmatism. When I came to Covenant Seminary, I mixed with people like Jerem Bars and Richard Winter and others who were anything but pragmatists, but they were holistic people. So they were asking me questions of how I related with my wife, what my relationship with my children was. Um, so it was not, are you doing the right thing? It was just, are you letting the impact of the gospel reach to all the dimensions of existence as an individual, but then also as a corporate person, as a member of the body of Christ, as a citizen in this world, etc. So that has revolutionized my thinking and um, uh, challenged me in many ways. And so uh, this particular work on apostolic bedrock is in some ways um, a, uh, an attempt to say, I cannot stay purely with the issue of discipleship. I cannot stay purely with the issue of formation. But on the other hand, I cannot remain purely with issues of Christology and early Christian origins, etc. I have to somehow look at both disciplines. So that was uh, point number one. Now we're moving on to uh, the uh, relationship between Jesus and Peter. And uh, uh, I'm going to go rather rapidly through these biographical notes. You are well acquainted with them. And uh, uh, I have a lot of text here. Sometimes I will go into it, and sometimes I will not. Uh, just depending on what we uh, need to do. Uh, Peter is uh, uh, associated with Bethsaida, and um, uh, I think it is uh, Richard um, Bockham uh, in his study, and also Marcus Bockmuhl, who emphasized the fact that Peter was shaped in his early years in a more Hellenistic setting of Bethsaida. And I'm just assuming that you're aware of what that would mean in terms of language. The argument for bilingual upbringing for Peter is significant here. And I'm just trying to recover 
a Peter from a hillbilly from the hinterland to somebody who is pretty well acquainted with uh, uh, Hellenistic culture, with the Hellenistic, uh, with Greek language, before perhaps his father uh, thinks that it would be good to move from Bethsaida over to Capernaum, where in the wake of return of Jews to Galilee, there is perhaps a little bit more a, a Jewish revival, a good synagogue, a uh, traditional Jewish life, and maybe the father thinks that um, to take uh, somebody like Peter before he goes into synagogue school age seven, uh, that would be a good thing to do. <clears throat> so these are some assumptions. Some of them are um, educated guesses. But um, <clears throat> I think um, uh, Marcus Bockmill is right in saying don't overlook the shaping and the impact of Bethsaida on Peter's life and then uh, the formation in Capernaum. Uh, as uh, Peter moves to Capernaum, here we have Bethsaida here. Capernaum would be over there on the other side. We're flying in from the north here. Uh, uh, this is uh, a little bit outside of the um, uh, Galilee. So he's uh, kind of on the border of Galilee in his early years. Oops, this thing is falling apart. Uh, he uh, then moves into the Galilean world, um, and obviously we could say a lot of what that means, that he is uh, part of the Galilean life. Um, this is an artist's rendering of Capernaum where uh, uh, Peter would have settled. Um, there are some things that are probably archaeologically less convincing, some more, but uh, here is now the so-called Peter House in this area, and here is the uh, synagogue that has had various uh, historical layers uh, through, the, uh, through the ages. Um, Peter would have grown up in that kind of a setting, and uh, uh, I think it's instructive to know that uh, Capernaum was not uh, completely isolated of a small fishing village, but it was on the so-called Via Maris. Here is a, a marking stone of that, uh, linking uh, Damascus with North Africa. And actually, there is a separate route going down here and intersecting with that Via Maris from Tyre. So uh, we need to revise our perspective on what Capernaum represented. Um, in terms of its geographic location, and then also the kind of life that Peter lived as a young person. Um, some people put the inhabitant number, inhabitants, I've, I've seen one or two commentaries at 10,000. I think that's a little rich, but I'm happy to be corrected. But at least 1,000, 1,500 in, in, uh, inhabitants. Um, Caravans would stop by Capernaum. You can already get the feel of a taxation system with Matthew, uh, Peter in the fishing industry. Um, uh, so there were not only taxes uh, collected from travelers, but also fishermen. Uh, I uh, believe that uh, Peter uh, paid ta fishing taxes, harbor taxes, sales taxes, all kinds of different forms of um, uh, um, uh, revenue that he had to pay for uh, for his particular work. An interesting aspect about Capernaum is this Roman centurion who uh, uh, probably sponsored a synagogue uh, that was relatively new when uh, Jesus began to preach there and uh, where uh, Peter then uh, perhaps would have already gone to synagogue school there, but that's perhaps, uh, uh, he, he perhaps went to a place that uh, uh, was then not in existence anymore. Um, the the uh, Capernaum as a center of uh, work for Jesus in the Galilean phase is very well uh, known. And uh, you can see here also the connection between Nazareth and Capernaum in terms of uh, Mary uh, visiting there, etc., and Jesus' statement about family, etc. So, uh, Capernaum has a lot to say. I want to uh, pick out one thing, and it is this basalt synagogue that was built in 727 AD. Uh, so, that is where the public ministry of Jesus then occurs. Uh, and it is amazing, I was surprised 
how many things happened in Capernaum when you go through the Synoptic Gospels and John. In fact, I have a list here, and that could be expanded, and I'm not going to go through all of that, obviously, but Capernaum was just a massive place of uh, Jesus' uh, ministry. I'm going back here briefly. So in 70 AD, there's a destruction of a basalt synagogue, and between 70 and 90 AD, there's this purported house of Peter, and I'm careful about that. I wouldn't want to put my hand in the fire, uh, that that is actually Peter's house, but uh, it is interesting that it is no longer a family dwelling. Uh, perhaps it was used as a house church, as a meeting place of worship. Um, there are some indications that it had some Christian leanings, uh, uh, information regarding that. So that is an interesting point here. And then obviously there are various other dates associated with Capernaum. <clears throat> We're going to move forward rather quickly uh, to uh, uh, the same artist's rendering of Capernaum at the time of Peter. And we're just briefly going to go into the world of Peter as a uh, young person. Um, uh, this here is the now known as the uh, Peter House, the so-called Peter House, and this would be the synagogue location. So you see the geographical proximity, uh, and then obviously uh, the workbench of uh, Peter out in the Sea of Galilee. Uh, so it's a compact microcosm that uh, Peter is shaped in, and particularly uh, with um, uh, synagogue school. I have some authentic pictures of Peter uh, in the early stages here. This is uh, Peter as a synagogue student, and uh, I'm going to go into that a little bit. Because uh, Rainer Riesner is correct in his book, Jesus as Teacher and various other Scandinavian school uh, people, that Jesus most likely utilized synagogue teaching methodology to train his disciples much more methodically than is uh, sometimes assumed. Uh, I uh, hear that uh, Riesner is currently working on his fourth edition of Jesus as teacher. He's now retired from uh, Dortmund back in his home area around the Tübingen area and probably by the end of this year he should uh, be coming out with a fourth edition dealing with all kinds of critical questions to this. But I think there is a good merit to that to say <clears throat> what Peter is about to enter here at age seven, from age seven to 14, according to Josephus, um, is a schooling that Jesus will begin with and connect with. So it's kind of synagogue schooling too at the beginning stages of the formation of Peter, and so that's going to be important for us as we think about theological education. Uh, basically, these synagogue schools uh, are simple, but very focused. This is not a picture, as you can tell, from uh, uh, the uh, Middle East. I wonder if it's maybe a synagogue school in Warsaw or something along those lines. So these are just illustrations. They're not historically focused. But in these synagogue schools, these little boys aged 7 to 14 would be trained to memorize. Memorize scripture, key, key aspects of scripture, and that memorization would have two trajectories. One would be synagogue participation after graduation from that synagogue school age 14. The other one would be life. And so this is the formation aspect. I think the pedagogical assumption in Jewish synagogue schools was as follows. Get into these pre-adolescent boys' heads the truth of God's word, such as Proverbs 1 to 6. They didn't have a clue what the fire was. They didn't have a clue what the attraction of a beautiful woman at the corner would be. They would probably say, ew, in their little synagogue schools, but they would have to memorize, beware, beware of that. So they, they would have the memory of warnings, of instruction, of guidance, etc. And the hope was that the school of life would teach them wisdom to do what they had learned, what they had memorized. So that's a little simplistic presentation, but it, there's no doubt that 
like many other pedagogical structures around uh, Galilee, uh, memorization was the key. Um, and so uh, uh, somebody like Peter would be exposed to that uh, Sunday morning through Friday afternoon, and then Sabbath morning being in synagogue in the synagogue himself, and then uh, Sabbath afternoon, the father would check what Peter would have learned the previous week. So it would be constant recall, constant repetition of uh, key uh, aspects of uh, scripture. And um, uh, Riesner's dissertation, originally published in 1981, makes the case that there are many, many incidental indications, especially in the Synoptic Gospels, but also in John, that show that Jesus actually applied similar methodology to the disciples. We do have this sequence of hearing, not understanding, and then at a certain point, grasping things. So I'm here, number four, actually Jesus as an intentional educator. Uh, I'm assuming you know a lot more about synagogue education, what is going on there. Uh, we are going to move on to the similarities and dissimilarities between Jesus' pedagogy and that of synagogue schools. Riesner and others have identified various aspects, such as life on life, Jesus living with the disciples, uh, exemplifying by his conduct, asking questions, being in controversial situations, and the disciples watching what Jesus would do, etc. So there are many aspects that pedagogically can be uh, put forth to say, yes, uh, Jesus associated and picked up the disciples at that basic stage of memorization, but then he took them further by the simple fact that there was a uh, living situation. So you can already move a little bit into uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Finkenwalter situation where uh, this underground seminary was based not only on uh, intellectual growth, on knowledge, understanding, etc., but on practice, uh, Bible study, personal prayer, personal devotion to Christ, quietness before him, etc. So you see uh, some of those connections between uh, what Jesus did with his disciples and uh, how that is similar but also distinct from uh, synagogue education. What I'd like to try with you now is to move even beyond that. And I hadn't done that for many years. Uh, this is number C, or section C, shaping the affections of the heart. I am fascinated by the fact that Jesus didn't just go beyond synagogue education and patterns of training, memorization to life on life, but there was something more radical and more significant happening. And I'm trying to identify what was that. So I'm going to move fast here uh, uh, beyond where we um, uh, uh, have uh, started with his life. Here are uh, at least three passages. In fact, we could add one from Luke that actually John Lennox uh, mentioned a few days ago. Um, uh, a shaping of messianic expectation. Now, you think I'm going to take you down the trail of Christology, but you're mistaken. I am thinking about formation. So hang with me. So initially we need to just briefly review that I am convinced that there was a certain Davidic royal political messianic expectation that uh, Peter in synagogue school through his Pharisaic uh, teachers acquired. And it is shown perhaps best in John 6.15 uh, that there was some attempt to make Jesus into a messianic Davidic royal king. Uh, Mark 8.32 reflects that, and Peter took him aside after Jesus had said that the Son of Man must die and be raised again. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. 
And in Acts 1, uh, 6, I may have a slightly different view than John Lennox on this particular issue. It's a complex one. But here it says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? The, the common tr trend here, including the um, a passage of Cleopas and his uh, companion on the road to Emmaus is, we expect you to be a messianic Davidic royal liberator. And we are patient with you. When are you going to do that? Now I'm setting you up for what I believe is the crucial point of theological training. So I'm not taking you down the road of Christology, even though we're constantly going there. We have to go there. But the point is not for us to grasp solid synoptic Christology. The point is, what does that do to Peter? What does it do to his formation? What is going on there? So I'm assuming this. I know the discussion is much more complex. And in Apostolic Bedrock, I, I do go a little bit into various other expectations, but I think there's still a relatively good consensus that the pervasive, simple, generalized expectation was that. What did Jesus bring? Um, I am arguing in this little book that uh, has another funny story, uh, that uh, Jesus brings uh, a double crisis of self and God perception into the life of Peter. I'm going more into the double crisis of self and God perception in this book than in the other one. Uh, I think that's what's going on. And in a very simple way, uh, I can uh, uh, describe it this way. Jesus does not only embed memorized material in Peter's mind. He does not only have life on life, fireside chats and meals and relationship and uh, experience together. But he actually systematically leads Peter and the other disciples into a double crisis. Namely, who is your God and who are you? Now that sounds very philosophical, and I've been accused in one review of this little uh, book on atheology that there is no such thing in the Gospel of Mark. Nowhere does Jesus ask, what do you think about God and who are you? And uh, the particular reviewer thought that with that he had already finished me. Uh, I persist, especially if we had time to go slowly through Mark 6, 7, and 8. That after the initial call of the disciples and actually sending them out and uh, having them participate in his mission, Jesus puts the slow motion movie, presses that button, and says, now that we've gone through a certain phase, let me go much deeper. Because, Peter, you persist in a self-perception that is an effect of the fall. And you persist in a God perception that is the effect of a combination of selective Old Testament reading and intertestamental reductionism. And those two lead you to be an anthropocentric, uh, autonomous, Jewish person who tries to serve God on his own terms. And a truncated God for that. Now, if this thesis is correct, we're touching the heart of theological education. Because we cannot only say we need to fill the minds of our students with good knowledge, good skill, good abilities, and we do not only need to have them at our table and have personal fellowship with them and, and connection, but they actually have to undergo a double crisis of self-perception and God-perception if they are to be living letters who are transformed like Peter was under the tutelage of Christ. So that's the thesis. That's what I'm putting forth. That's a challenge that I'm wrestling with myself. And obviously, none of us are Jesus who train our Peters. So obviously, we are participants in that same work of Christ through his Holy Spirit and his work, 
that Jesus did directly with Peter, we mediate that. We, we simply say, this is what happened to Peter, this is what needs to happen to me, this is what needs to happen to you, and then uh, to our students. So that's really the fundamental point that I want to try out on you and for you to then uh, decapitate me. I'm very sad that the door is here rather than here for me to uh, you know, go from, am uh, from amongst you and disappear. Um, so that's what I'm wrestling with, is that the theological formation and the character formation of Peter was even more radical than something like Finkenwalde. And I don't know what happened there, and I don't need to evaluate that. I'm simply saying, what does it mean to be under the authority of God's word, uh, particularly here in this case, uh, the, uh, the Gospels. Um, and I would say this is not an initial uh, exposure to this double crisis, but I am arguing that as, as you can follow Peter's life through the first part of the book of Acts and then first and second Peter to actually trace an ongoing double crisis in which the question of who is your God, Peter, and who are you, Peter, constantly gets revisited in terms of you, you can say doctrinally who God is. He could actually say that before he met Christ. But even after he met Christ, he would be able to, very, in a very orthodox sense, say, Christ is the Messiah, etc., etc. And yet, it was a limited Christ who would not reach to certain areas of ethnic groups, etc. And he would have still said, my self-perception is still one of um, decreasing but still present autonomy still a self-centeredness, a self-determination. And you see here how Jesus' call to deny yourself and to follow Christ actually applies at the extremely deep level. And so uh, uh, I would say I have experienced that in my own personal life, this ongoing double crisis, but I would also say that is an aspect of theological education that uh, our students are actually initially drawn into that, and then they are co cognizant and aware of that, that God is actually in the business of drawing all of us into this double crisis, not because we're supposed to find a new God. We're not redefining doctrine, but we are supposed to be impacted more and more deeply by who God really is and by who we really are. So in some ways we're catching up with reality that is brought to us through uh, Christ's coming, Christ's teaching, Christ's atonement on our uh, behalf, etc. So this is, this is basically the uh, uh, understanding here and this is perhaps the central slide uh, I have been meditated on this tonight again, last night again. Uh, I still suffer from jet lag, so I was awake from one till four, and I was able to think about this. Now, knowing some of us as theologians, we will latch on to this picture and say, is this correct? Is this, is this really interesting and true Christology here? But again, I will defraud you and say, Yes, there's an enormous amount of Christology here. We need to reflect on this. But in the end, this is the DNA of transformation of Peter. And I hope that you can follow me with that. Now, first of all, there has been a little bit of a uh, change in my understanding from looking at the Old Testament in terms of messianic expectations to what Christopher Wright also calls the expectation of Yahweh coming. Now, I don't know if you're acquainted with that, but to me, the whole thing began when I reflected on Isaiah 40, verse 3, because it's preparing the way of Yahweh. It's not preparing the way of some Davidic figure, some Messiah, some whatever. It's preparing the way of Yahweh. And then when that predicted one comes, 
it is what I would call maybe in a blasphemous way, Yahweh and sandals. Uh, now this has huge ramifications and basically this entire left area here is trying to put together a much richer understanding of God's coming near to his people at the culmination of time with the incarnation of Christ than would be expected in certain selective messianic texts. So my argument here is that this box represents Pharisaic, broadly speaking, teaching of the expectation of the Messiah which does not reflect the riches, the, uh, the riches and the richness of Old Testament raising of anticipation of what God would do at a certain point in history. So obviously with this would take a long time and there would probably be theological differences between us, uh, what to think about various texts, but I think this is an incredibly rich world, and I believe that Jesus connects with this rich world rather than with a narrow, particularized anticipation, as important as 2 Samuel 7, 12 uh, following is. So I'm not trying to erase this in favor of that, but I am arguing that the anticipation of Yahweh coming to his people is much greater. And then basically based on studies in Mark, but you can see that also in the other Gospels, Jesus explodes the box. That's what I mean by exploding the box. Downward and upward. Upward in claiming blasphemously to the high priest that he is the exalted son of man according to Daniel 7.14, and that he is, as John Lennox has also referred to, uh, the uh, Adoni of Psalm 110. And there are fascinating studies on both of those, uh, referred to in the Gospel of Mark, and then obviously also in the other Gospels. But also exploding the box downward. Uh, and it is mostly surrounding Isaiah 52, the fourth uh, Isaiah song, uh, and then connected in Mark 8, 34, 10, 45, etc. Now this is Christology. This is what uh, some of us at least would say, this is what the Messiah of God is, vis-a-vis -vis or in contradistinction to the uh, political uh, Davidic royal narrow expectation of the Messiah. What has dawned on me only more recently is that this is a graph of theological education. And that's obviously where I'm supposed to be going in this talk here. And how does that relate? If you put Peter in the box, if you put him in the synagogue school initially, and he would have received a selective reading. Maybe he's aware of some of these other texts, but because of the Maccabean uprising and various other things, he would have been pretty conditioned to say, when the Messiah of God comes, he's going to function in this particular way. That's why I'm sometimes saying that Peter had a plan for Jesus live. And then Jesus comes into Peter's life. What happens to his box? Not just Christology, but to you and me. Is it a different God that comes to us? Is it a replacement of the Old Testament? Are we now leaving the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we're becoming Jesus-only people, like some of us uh, tend to go? which I'm always very sensitive to. I think we need to be solidly Trinitarian all the time in a wholesome way. What happens to Peter as that box is broken open? Well, there are two things that happen. It is the crisis of God perception. Who is, who is God as Jesus comes near to Peter? Who is, who is he? Not a different God, 
It's not that he has to relearn what he knows. It's actually discovering more of the riches of the God that has revealed himself. And obviously to realize that the second person of the Trinity, while not conspicuously in the Old Testament, is alluded to by passages of Daniel 7, 14, who is the son of man who receives glory, power, honor, and perhaps even with the Aramaic word worship. And then who is this person that is so exalted that God who does not share his glory with anyone will share his glory with Adonai. So you do have Old Testament hints. They're not explicit statements of a Trinitarian development, but they are very solid, open questions. And Daryl Bach has been right in his book on blasphemy in Judaism to point out that these are two of the most tender Jewish passages in terms of interpretation because they seem to indicate that there is some, somebody in the proximity of Yahweh who shouldn't be there. So there's something there, and I think it's good, Old Testament interpretation, not to make it more, but also not less than it speaks of. So you see the crisis of God perception. It's the same God, but now Christ coming is really pushing what you make of Old Testament texts and who God really is. And then here, this is even more profound, or not more, but um, challenging. Peter wants to have a political liberator in Jerusalem. He wants to have somebody who has power, who has resources, who has abilities, and Jesus seems to be a candidate. A strange candidate, but still a candidate. Even Judas goes, goes along with Jesus for a while, considering him to be a candidate to deliver. And now, Peter, so we're, we're away from Christology into the question of discipleship formation. Peter realizes that the one he has a plan for does something for him that he doesn't see he needs. He does not need an atoning, sacrificing, uh, punished by the Father for his a rebellion kind of a messiah. And so I would argue here that you see the nucleus of the crisis of God perception and especially the crisis of self perception. Who, who am I to need something like that? And it's precisely the artwork that we have, and I'm so sorry that I did not make reference to it in the plenary talk. I, that's one of my main griefs. I mean, I pontificated from the manuscript too much, but the Bible that is in the entrance room to the plenum uh, is made out of metal, rusting metal. It's decaying matter. But there are eyes in there, non-matter eyes, looking at you. And that's precisely what's going on here. There are eyes looking at us. Jesus has eyes looking at Peter. And the diagnosis is much more overwhelming than we would like to have. Peter has a casuistic understanding of sin. Pharisaic Judaism does not have an ontological sense of sinfulness. Uh, Peter has a flat understanding of the sovereignty, and the glory, and the protective power of the eternal Son of God, and he certainly does not have a Pondus Picati understanding. He wants to have somebody to help him get rid of the burden of taxation, etc. Things which are in social justice very important. Jesus is not indifferent to social injustice, but he latches on to the most fundamental issues. And I, for one, believe that it is human nature to reduce pondus peccati and to minimize it. When I'm confronted with my own enmity against God, my own rebellion, my own life, my own battle for doing things my way and then baptizing it with some uh, pious prayer, 
I realize that the diagnosis that comes towards me, the eyes of scripture that look at me, are much more disheartening but also embracing than I would have thought. And so I would argue that while this is a slide on Christology, on the difference between the Messiah of God and the expected Messiah in Palestinian Judaism, it is also a slide on um, theological education, biblical training of the heart of people. And I believe when you place this with the outpouring of the Spirit in Pentecost, where the, the result of belief in the purification of the substitutionary atonement of Christ and the, the uh, confession that Jesus is curious is there, it is trained, it is embedded. And now the fire of the Spirit uh, emboldens to confirm, to uh, uh, give an, a certainty of that reality, uh, that then you have the mixture, the combustion mixture of the explosion of early Christianity. It is not a great powerful movement. It is the result of a radical transformation. And I want to uh, share with you personally that this transformation of the heart is such a huge thing because we cannot have effect in Europe, particularly in terms of evangelism, just by better uh, apologetics, <clears throat> by better argumentations, as important as all of those things are. So I'm looking here for the untouchable and yet central aspect of formation. Let me make one point on C3. Assuming that this thesis is right, that there's something much more radical that has to happen in theological education for men and women to be captured by the reality of God and to actually see that a life of faith is not a life of attempt. It's a life of catching up with reality. And it's returning to who we are and to be restored by the sacrifice of Christ to who we are meant to be. This mission here is a very interesting aspect in the formation. Again, I'm not taking away from the mission of God, but I'm looking at formation in mission. And I see how Jesus says, now you go and tell, now you go and proclaim, now and uh, make disciples. And with that instruction, with that command, the commanded is being transformed. So the Great Commission is actually a further shaping of Peter. That's the argument. And you know that very well. The best learner is a teacher. Uh, the best way to, to uh, be, be changed, to be shaped, is to be given um, a commission, uh, something to go about. You're working on a text edition. Uh, I know some of you of what you're doing. Uh, many of you I do not. Uh, you're involved in a particular discipline. That shapes you. Uh, in German, we use the phrase of an seine Arbeit wachsen, to grow in the task that is given to you. That's part of the Gesellen understanding that a Geselle who is practicing to become a master is shaped by his uh, task. So it's not just that you are now doing something, but you're actually being formed. And so uh, think about it, the mission of God uh, as part of the formation of his people. Uh, and uh, that is a beautiful thing. Here is one formation in Peter's life uh, in Acts 10, 22. That's a crazy thing if you think about it, that you're supposed to go to the suppressing, occupying power. Do you see the irony here? If, G if Peter had a plan for Jesus' life to get rid of these guys, get them out. And now he is sent to bring to those who he wanted Jesus to throw out of Israel, he's presenting the kingdom of God, the rule of God over Cornelius. I mean, think that through.
That's crazy to go to your enemy, to go to the ones that oppressed you and to offer them the salvation in Christ. But that's exactly what's happening here. Peter is defiling himself constantly and he is shaped by that, formed further. In what way? In the crisis of God perception and self perception. Not that he is suddenly serving another god. I hope you get that. I'm not arguing for a new theology or a theology in the making. It's catching up with the magnitude of the god that we are serving. And crisis of self-perception. Who's in charge here? Well, I'm not going to eat defiled food, etc. You know the whole argument of Acts 10 and 11. And then Peter comes back and reports in Jerusalem, I believe God is bigger than what I did before Acts 10, and I am a little less in control of the mission of God, the agenda of God. I take my place and I praise God that he's helping me to do that. So there is crisis of self-perception in the uh, outgrowth in the following of the mission of God. So uh, I find that just fascinating. Uh, this is the last point that I wanted to bring here, uh, and then a few pra um, you know, practice uh, questions at the end. I am fascinated by First Peter um, because if you believe that the Gospel of Mark is a reflection of the Gospel of Peter, uh, not the apocryphal one, but according to Papias, that we actually have access to Peter's pe teaching and preaching in the Gospel of Mark. And if we believe that the gospel, uh, that the, the first part of the book of Acts gives us historically reliable access to what Jesus taught, uh, what Peter taught, and if you still have the audacity to believe in the Petrine authorship of First Peter, you come to the following conclusion. <clears throat> And one student said it brilliantly to me. I can hardly believe the transformation of Peter. Hardly. It's nearly impossible. If you take the whole spectrum fully in, and some of the initial synagogue training and expectation to this place where we have Peter here, in terms of not a brainless, but a voluntary conformity to the mind of God and a settled, peaceful, healthy understanding of self in that. That you see here that the crisis of God and self-perception have been brought, not to its final point, but to a great place of maturity in which you have a healthy, non-domineering, leading witness who rests in the power of God and who is settled with himself and doesn't have to push an agenda. That's why I'm arguing in Apostolic Bedrock that the portrait of Peter and Irenaeus and the portrait of Peter and First Peter cannot be the same. There are two, two Peter pictures and I think this one is the true Peter. Uh, so you can read Oscar Coleman and others on this whole trajectory. But here I would say, suffering and the formation of the whole person, uh, this is where theological education goes with us, and then obviously with our students, that we have a grasp of what it means so that you might follow in his footsteps. I have a little excursus in Apostolic Bedrock of following Jesus and Mark in Acts and First Peter. And that's a very interesting study because Peter doesn't blink once by saying, oh, I don't see him anymore. Following him was easy while I saw him. Now I don't see him anymore. I have problems now. See, seamlessly goes through. So think about uh, that in terms of following. But here you see what some people call a cruciformity. You, you, you see how Peter doesn't have a plan for Jesus' life anymore. He accepts the plan of God for his life, bringing him to cruciformity and shaping him into a person who is at peace 
with the growing power of God and taking his healthy place within them. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Here you can uh, keep in mind 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Do you see the contrast here between Peter who says, by no way will you die who has a plan for Jesus' life, and now somebody who realizes that the way God comes is to shape Peter into a Christ-like person who is willing to suffer, who is willing to trust in the vindication of God in this world as a member of the mission of God, participant of the mission of God. Um, uh, the bold parts here are mostly what Peter encourages his readers to uh, think about uh, many of the other parts is what Jesus has done. And I think uh, we have to be very careful that we don't misinterpret this passage as saying, here you have early Catholic moral self-improvement. Uh, you see that there is a foundation in the atonement of Christ and also the example of Christ in which the follower of Christ is to follow. We're never to be Christ's, but we are called to be Christ-like. So if somebody reads you, they will read a surrendered person that is willing to suffer, that is willing to be brought to the end of him and of herself resources, and that counts existentially on the intervention and power of the God who raises from the dead. So it's a very profound place where I, as a German, have constantly doubts and uh, wrestling problems. And if my wife were here, she would say uh, he still has quite a problem with self-defense and self-sufficiency and pride, etc. She would be able to confess my sins very well. Um, so uh, I want to leave you with this. Obviously, you have to work on all of these aspects to see if they're true, if it's convincing, and uh, to see that that would be um, a goal of theological education. Now, just briefly here, uh, I, I'm putting three points out, and I've told you in the beginning, I'm not a very good practitioner. I dream of working with small groups of students. I have classes of 40, 50, 60, 70 students. I don't know their names. I don't know if they're going to die tomorrow. I don't know whether they ha had a divorce yesterday, whether his wife had a miscarriage or not. And I'm pontificating about Christology, and that's it. So it was a caricature, I admit. We do have some office hours. We do meet with some students. but. But if I have a small group of students, maybe 12, I can find out where are they, what are they thinking. I had Adam in my class and I figured out this guy has a lot of reading already, so I don't need to do certain things. And let me help to get Adam from where he is a little further along. So uh, when you have small groups, you can zero in where they are but not only zero in in terms of their knowledge and reading, which Adam had a lot, but formation. So uh, family, uh, life, circumstances. But then also, that's the third thing, what is going on in Adam's heart in terms of cruciformity? What is going on in terms of the double crisis? And uh, I've had the privilege of hearing from Adam on all levels. We compare notes, we take soundings of each other.
that's a beautiful thing. Uh, second point, holistic personal relationships. I'm probably the worst person to talk to you about that. The only thing I've found in the last 40 years of theological education is to look at a class and say, God, I cannot handle this mass of people. Show me two, three, four over the next 10 years that I should pray for. Maybe they will come to me. Maybe there's a little bit more of a relationship that develops. I won't call them I won't call it discipling. I won't call it mentoring. I won't call it coaching. But I'll somewhat engage personally with that. Adam is one of those persons that somehow God has put us together. We got to collaborate last November in Hungary. Uh, I get to see his family. I get to see his life. He gets to see my life. But do you see how how horribly inefficient that is. It's just crazy. In terms of my work as a teacher at Covenant Seminary with hundreds of students, and then I teach in various places in the Central European and Western European area, it's impossible. So less is more. I'm not God. I don't have to carry the mission of God in Europe. But God, let me be faithful to some. And then thirdly, the reciprocal engagement in the mission of God. I've learned enormously from people like Adam or Mark Sterling in Scotland um, or John Cudi in uh, St. Petersburg or Christian, uh, for that matter, as we co-labored in IFES and Schloss Mittese. So <clears throat> God is an incredibly economic educator. And if you begin to teach somebody, and you know that I'm preaching to the choir, you are one of the major students in that uh, involvement. So God has this reciprocity um, in learning. So I want to encourage you along those lines, but I'm frustrating you to no end with absolutely no how to do things uh, instruction. But perhaps we can start thinking about, is there something here that we should think more about beyond content and skill development, beyond even life on life towards this kind of cruciformity and uh, growth uh, in maturing in the double crisis of God and self-perception. And obviously, it's not only self-perception, but it's perception of others, and even perception of the creation, because the creation mandate has not been overruled by the uh, uh, Great Commission.